Okay, so hi everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, Oak Ridge's Marine Land Trust loves to do these sort of events and we're really lucky to have our actual program manager Aileen presenting tonight. We love to hear her talking, you know, day to day. She's operating the charity, um, but we love to see her skills in action. So very grateful to have her tonight. Before we get started, we're just going to go uh, over our little bit of an intro. I know we have a lot of people here tonight that um, have supported us for a long time. So bear with us. Might be some regular information you've heard before, uh, but we'll also list our upcoming events. So with that, I will uh, just share my screen and get started. It's going to get started with a land acknowledgement, as we always like to. Um, so we would like to start off by acknowledging that we are on, tradi on the traditional territories of the Wandat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples, whose presence here continues to this day. We would also like to acknowledge the land we are on is at the meeting place of two treaties, the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and those of the First Nations of the Williams Treaties. We thank them and other Indigenous peoples for sharing this land with us. We would also like to acknowledge the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation as our closest Indigenous community. We acknowledge this land and the people because the first step to reconciliation is recognizing the existence of Indigenous people. A shared understanding of how our collective past brought us to where we are today will help us walk into a better future. We give deep gratitude to the Indigenous peoples of these lands who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. The Oak Ridge's Marine Land Trust endeavors to honor the land and its treaties by strengthening our relationship and responsibilities to them. Thank you for joining us in that. We do find it's really important to stay mindful of land acknowledgements and different groups may have different ones. So always listen carefully to the words that are spoken. Now, just to explain sort of what the Oak Ridge's Marine is and why it's so important nature that was created 13,000 years ago during the Ice Age. Um, it is home to hundreds of rare and at-risk species, which is extremely important to us. And one of the reasons it's important to everyone is that it is a source of drinking water for over 250,000 people. Additionally, it does have um, a lot of rivers and streams that kind of go along with that fresh water. 90% of the marine is in private ownership, which is actually good in some ways as we could secure that through donations or purchases. Um, and 5% of the marine is wetlands. Now, what do we do? Uh, we envision that natural environments important to sustaining life are protected forever. So it's not that we are buying and selling or having donations and then giving it away. We're a registered charity that works to ensure a healthy ecosystem and natural environment that thrives forever on and adjacent to the Oak Ridge's Marine um, is you know, in our possession and the land trust's possession for the long haul. Uh, we also have partnered properties as well and we do our best to maintain them in a natural way. So if you haven't seen it, this is a map of our uh, Oak Ridge's Moraine. So as you see, it stretches all the way from Peel to Northumberland. And the little dots there are actually our properties. Um, we have about, we have 60 and counting um, as of 2021. And we're really looking forward to increasing that number. One of the ways that we secure properties is through the Ecological, ecological Gifts Program. Uh, it creates land that is federally protected forever, which is extremely important. Landowners leave a legacy for future generations and it creates a significant tax benefit for landowners who donate land um, or do it through a conservation easement. Now we also do outreach and education programs. These you'll be very familiar with as this is an example of one. And we do have a couple of free programs, although um, obviously things are updating constantly with the current situation in the province. So one that is happening for sure, and I uh, really hope all of you participate this weekend, is our Backyard Biolympics track and field. This is a fantastic opportunity to go outside by yourself, with your spouse, or with your family, and practice what you learn at this webinar. Um, it's really great. You just use a mobile app, take a picture, and submit your pictures of tracks to us and we'll count up all the observations and see how many we can get as a group across the region. We also are doing a safe hiking webinar. This is great for people of all ages. This will take place on February 9th. 
Um, it just teaches you what to pack, how to prepare, how to take care of your footing, making sure that you're not slipping and falling and causing injury. Um, like I said, it's important for anyone that's looking to get outdoors. And lastly, we're doing self-guided walks every other Friday afternoon um, with booked times from 12 to 3. This is a new program that we're launching. And basically, we are not doing an organized event, but we're allowing you on our property for the first time ever to, to uh, enjoy the trail on your own. And if you want to stay in the know, we, we do have an e-newsletter um, and you can follow us on Facebook. We tend to post our events there as well um, so you can find out when they're scheduled. And if you want to ask us about how to do that, you can email us or phone us and I'll put it on the next slide as well. So again, if you want to contact us or learn more about registering or becoming a member with us or giving a gift, this is our contact information. Um, and if I go too fast for you, free, feel free to just ask it in the chat as well. And if you have to ask questions, um, join the presentation, throw them in the chat or in the Q&A box and Aileen will get to them when she can. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing now and uh, let Aileen take over. All right. Hopefully, uh, are you doing that? No, okay. Are you done sharing? Because then I can do it. I don't know why it's not letting me. <laughs> there it is. All right. Technology. That was awesome. All right. So um, we're here. We're going to talk about tracking different animals. Um, it is going to be kind of an introductory, but at the same time, there is a lot of information. Um, I tried to make it fun, but you can see up over here, I've got a snowy owl and over here, I've got a barred owl and over here is my little long-eared owl. So you can see they're quite small. Their bodies are only about that big, those long, long wings. Just so it, it was kind of a little bit more fun than just watching me. <laughs> got some nice dead, um, taxidermied animals because why not? Um, I don't normally have them for the record. They're uh, an education tool that I just happen to have at home because of COVID and things like that. But it is, um, it's always good to be in a random meeting and pop up some owl over your head. <laughs> um, I'm going to be cracking jokes because I can't see or hear you. I'm just going to assume you're all dying in laughter and, and thinking it's the funniest thing ever. Okay, so learning animal tracks. Um, I learn every time I look at a track. I, I'm I still get stumped. I got stumped last week on a track, um, which turned out to be a very unique track, and I'll talk a bit about that. Um, animals never, you know, they're they're wild, they're alive. They they follow most of the rules, but there's always exceptions, um, and there's also different conditions. So we're going to uh, talk about some of the things that you need to consider when you're, I guess, evaluating or analyzing a track. Okay, so. Things to look at, and this chart on the on the side there um, is pretty accurate. I'm just going to move this. So you maybe get a perfect print that looks just like the books 5% of the time. 75% are the others and 20% are the others, but in brown. <laughs> so um, it, you can't just look at the track. And I heard someone describe this just recently. The track itself is a paragraph of the whole book. And if you read the paragraph, sometimes you kind of get the idea of the book, but you really have to look at the whole pattern. Um, the print quality is never going to be great, at least around here. Um, snow is very variable. There's days when it's slightly warm and the snow isn't quite melting, but it's still, I guess, damp enough to, for an animal to leave an impact and it's not deep enough that you lose that detail. Then it's like, woohoo, I can see everything. Uh, I had one of those days last week. It was pretty cool. <laughs> um, where was it taken? So I'll see people that, you know, downtown Toronto, and they'll say, is this a wolf? No, sorry, wolves have nothing to do with people. They don't like them. They're up north. Um, you know, was this a lynx? Again, probably not in Toronto. However, you never know, because a moose showed up at Markham, so. Uh, we're going to look at shape, the number of toes, the size, the scale is very important. And then we're going to look at measuring, how to measure properly. So let's just move to the first one. So again, where was it taken? Um, here's the wolf on the right. This is the 
current distribution of our canids in Ontario. Explaining this is a, a whole other webinar and about 10 more after that. Um, there's a lot of neat genetic stuff, but in this area of York region, uh, Toronto, seeing a wolf is not going to happen. I mean, it could wander down like a moose, but they're not persistent. Our coyotes, um, there, there's that term coy wolf. It's Eastern coyotes. There's no two separate things. They do have some wolf DNA from historic breeding. They're not still at it. In some areas, it's a very slim chance it might happen. But so sometimes they will express um, more wolf-like characteristics. But the wolves have some coyote DNA in them from way back when they got a little desperate and you know lowered their standards. Um, and so sometimes they express coyote-like traits. So the eastern wolf, which are the ones in Algonquin area, and the eastern coyote can look almost identical. Um, and people tell me all the time, I saw a 120 pound wolf. Like, okay, no, <laughs> or a 125 pound coyote. Never happened, <laughs> doesn't exist. They've never ever caught one. And there's a lot of hunting of coyotes. So they have a lot of sample size to base that on. So just looking, if it's in this area and you're not near Algonquin Park or out in Frontenac Arch, you're not seeing a wolf. So that makes it so much easier to identify tracks. You just then have to figure out wolf or dog, or sorry, coyote or dog. Okay. Uh, lynx. Oh my gosh, I would, I think my head would explode if I saw one. Um, oops. And people have said to me, is this a lynx track? No, nope. because again, you're in Newmarket or, or Stovall or something. They're, they're not going to come down here. Okay. Um, even where they are, they're, they're very, very um, shy. You're lucky if you see one. They're, they're uh, um, kind of like that ghost out there. Most wild cats are. So, Think about is the range, and it's very simple. You just go on to Google and say, you know, whatever animal you think it is, what's the distribution range in Ontario? And usually a map will pop up. Um, and then that helps again, you know, when you first look at a track, you have all these potentials. So you have to kind of narrow it down. So then you're going to look at what the pattern of the track is. So I, I mentioned that the single track is not, most of the time, won't tell you the whole story. So certain animals have a standard movement. And this is again, you'll throughout this whole talk, I'll be like, except this, except that, because as I said, they're animals. So you have something like a pacer, and that would be a raccoon or a porcupine. And I'll show you some videos, but they tend to have a hind foot, and I, I'm not gonna bring my hind foot up because I'm not that flexible. But the hind foot and the front foot will be adjacent to each other. So you see sets of two that are two different sizes. Um, a gallop is going to be your bunny, your rabbit, or your squirrel for the most part. That's their standard gait. So uh, we'll, we'll make it interactive. In the chat, what do you think the human standard gait would be? What's our standard gait? Uh, <laughs> pacer some days heather <laughs> this morning was one yeah it would it would be a diagonal if we had four feet um so we're we're gonna walk one two one two if we had four legs it would be diagonal so we also run we hop we crawl we dance we do all kinds of crazy things but our standard gait is just a walk. So for something like a squirrel, they can walk. You see them doing that weird, it's just weird when they do it, but that weird kind of walk. But their standard gait is the gallop, okay? Um, a coyote standard gait looks like a trot, but it's a diagonal gait. Doesn't mean they're not pouncing or sniffing or doing different things. So we're gonna look at the standard gait. So again, when you're looking at a, a pattern of a track, if it doesn't make sense in the, this immediate area, keep following it. So uh, at one of our properties on Thursday, I saw a track and I was like, what on earth is this? It made no sense. It was two little footprints and a diagonal um, pattern and I couldn't think of anything it would be. So I kept following it and then I figured out what it was. It was a short-tailed weasel. And he went from walking to jumping to wiggling and was and then when I picked up the actual pattern, he was all over the place hunting. I didn't 
get to see it, unfortunately. And there were so many different gates. At one point, the difference between one of his bound gates, which is their standard gate, is the bound, was six feet. So you're talking at like basically a chipmunk size weasel that can jump six feet. But then in another track, it was doing a diagonal walk. And then another one, I'm still not sure what he was doing. He dug up or spun around or something. So follow the track, and usually you'll pick up, they'll revert to that standard gate. Does that make sense to everybody? I hate this because I can't see people nodding or looking at me like I have three heads. <laughs> and it's hard to follow the chat, too. Okay, people are on it. Good. Um, so the bound, the things like a mustelid. Um, and that's the weasel family. So that is river otters, mink, um, wolverine, but not down here. Um, Fisher, short tail weasel, long tail weasel. I'm forgetting one. Least weasel. Um, that's their their standard gait is that kind of hopping. So you get sets of four. Uh, sometimes it'll look like two because the feet are almost on top of each other. And then diagonal, as I said, coyote um, and also deer. But they will do what's called um, a double register of perfect placement, and we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. So this is your pattern, and that will help narrow it down to, again, you're taking that big, oh my gosh, what could this be? And you're getting it tighter and tighter and, and reducing your options. Uh, keep in mind, so a lot of the tracks you see out there that people think are coyote or something else are usually dogs especially locally and especially right now because everybody's out in the forest and the dogs are everywhere is that animals work on an extremely efficient and tight budget with their energy energy in energy out and they have to hunt to get that energy to come in they don't have excess energy so when you're looking at um a, tr a pattern and you're like oh this could be coyote it's diagonal but then it goes this way and that way and circles and back and and all that it's got a lot of energy and that's not typical of a wild animal because they conserve it. You might see it. So I, I, I saw this awesome one one time and it was three coyotes. I found an area where deer were bedded down and then I can see tracks coming in from three different areas. And then there was just chaos in the tracks. And what it was was the coyotes saw, oh, there's a couple deer down. They're not going to take a healthy deer, but maybe one of those deers is sick or injured and, and it's an easy catch. So they'll push and get them to move. And so there was a bit of scurrying and a bit of that kind of, but it was still in one, even with that, it was in one straight direction. And after about maybe 400 meters, obviously the deer were not injured. There was no blood. There was, they were running fine. The coyotes went, nope, not worth their energy. Stop the chase. And then I found a half eaten squirrel. <laughs> Poor coyotes, deer, squirrel. Hmm. <laughs> So, but even then with that chaoticness, you could still tell the story and it wasn't, there was a reason behind them not just going in a straight line. So if something is going around and back and forth and all over the place, uh, it's probably not a coyote, <laughs> okay? We feed our animals, they don't have to worry about anything. So they tend to have a lot more energy than uh, the wild animals. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm gonna show you examples of some of those movements. So the first one is our little raccoon. Hopefully you guys can still, oh, I think I have to, can you guys still see this? I can see the page with the links. Okay, so I have to switch my sharing. This is one of the Zoom things. Um, I'm gonna switch over and show you oh where to go molly the raccoon <laughs> all right can you see it now yeah okay so here's slow motion so you can see how the hind steps up and is next to that front paw and um opossums move like that somebody asked that so they're pacers so would porcupines so sometimes they're right next to each other. Molly's obviously a pet, so she's not fully tracking up. Maybe she's a little chunkier than she should be. So it might be something you see down in um, Toronto. All right, so we're gonna go back. So there you go. See, see there you can really see how they, they catch up. 
I used to try and demonstrate this myself. It didn't go well. Okay, and then I will show you the rabbit. Bear with me. All right. So here we have the rabbit gallop. Now, if you watch, the front legs land one after another. And if you look, the hind legs go in front of those. I hate when they fast forward. The hind legs go in front of those two front legs. So even though that's a gallop pattern, it's going to have a bit more of a Y shape to it. And we'll take a closer look at those. And then what's my next one? Squirrel? Nope. There's got to be an easier way to do this. <laughs> It's, it's great to have the visuals, but the, it's the oops, back and forth there. Okay, so this is squirrel, which I'm sure you've all seen in your backyard, but it kind of slows it down a bit. So this is another gallop. That's a bit more of a bound. Come on, squirrel, faster. Okay, let's see if we can get them moving. <laughs> there we go. So front legs land and then the back legs behind. When they get going, the back legs will actually land outside of the front legs. There you go, now you see it. Okay, so that's another gallop, but with that one, the front legs aren't gonna be above in front of each other, they'll be next to each other. And so the shape looks a bit more like a W to me. Okay, and then bear with me, there's a few more. Should have had a bear when I'm saying that. The coyote, so this is the, um, the walk. Coyotes, or any predator, they're going to be um, very efficient in how they place. They don't wanna make noise and they also wanna conserve their energy, like I said. So they tend to step into the footprint in front of them and that conserves energy, it also, reduces noise because if you know if you're stepping on a twig you're only doing it once and, and snapping it so that's um, kind of how they move ah, get big. so you can see that hind leg comes up and ends up usually right in the same track as that front foot and that's the diagonal walk So it's right into that footprint of that front foot. So sometimes it looks like they have more toes than they really do um, because they'll like double register and you'll get eight toes and you'll think, what? <laughs> and this one. Okay, so here's, this is their standard gait, the trot. And again, you can see that back leg steps right where the front leg is when they slow down it changes if there's anyone to ride horses it's a trot gait so they and that's the diagonal movement all right and then one more i think ah we'll skip the cheetah one Okay, so that is hopefully give you a bit of a visual um, that's better than me trying to do it that uh, demonstrates those movements I was talking about, the pace, the trots, and, and how they, they place their feet in, okay? So let's go to the next one. Oh, and then this video here. This is a pine martin. And we'll get to the mustelid family uh, because they... Um, they don't follow a typical rule some of the times. <laughs> so there we go. So next thing you're gonna look at is how many toes they have. So we're looking at, are they found in this area? How is their pattern of movement? And then how many toes they have? 
So it, it, horses are everywhere. And in, in the York Regional Forest, they're very, very popular because the footing, um, a lot of the local trails, you'll find them and people might get stumped and be like, what is this? They just have the one toe, which is their hoof. Um, and what can really mess it up is if they're barefoot or if they have shoes on. Um, and some of the shoes are, are interesting. Uh, there's ones that prevent snow packs, so they have a bubble on them. So you'll see a hoof print track and then either like marks from the stud in this weird round center thing. And it can distort. If it's clear, you can see, you know, it's a horseshoe shape. But if it's distorted, you can think, what on earth is here? Um, but if it's a one toe, we're just going to have a horse and they are very common or a donkey. So that's easy one toe and there's little sparky there, my sunshine. And there's a, just a look, it's kind of some of the variances of horseshoes. So he's got this rubber thing, sometimes it's a bulb. They have this big deep V, which is a frog, they call it. I'm not sure why, but it leaves a V shape. So you can get some weird looking prints from these guys, okay? Next one is two, two toes. So it's a basically a split hoof or an, um, two toes, I guess is how we'll call it. So two, um, and that would be deer, moose, and caribou. Around here, you're just pretty much looking at deer with the random moose. Um, and apparently there's a random elk around that escapes from an elk farm nearby. So you might even get an elk print. I've yet to see that. But most common will be the white-tailed deer. And you'll see on my little diagram on the right that they have those two dew, dew claws, dew things that um, will sometimes get an imprint. So you'll get the two hooves and then those two little um, um, heel marks there. Sorry, I'm forgetting the term. Old age, it's fun, you forget things. All right, and so that's kind of some of the tracks. Now I said you don't get off in a perfect track, perfect track like the one on the right. Oh, okay, it's obviously a deer. Sometimes you get these deep snow ones. And a coyote or a dog track, they also have a bit of a point. They can sometimes look like deer tracks. And they're also similar in, in the, the length of the stride. And then if you go to the far left, you'll see that there's just this, you just see these bound marks because they're running. So their typical movement is that diagonal, but if they're spooked, they'll run or hop. And you'll be like, what on earth is this? It's like something fell. So again, you have to look at all the other considerations. So now we jump up, we're doubling our toe count and we're going to uh, four toes. So this is your rabbits. We don't get snowshoe hairs quite down in this area. Um, I think Deb up by you, you'll get them. So I think Aurelia North um, and some that maybe come a little bit further down. I, I think I heard they were in Pepperlaw. Um, so typically you're going to get that cottontail rabbit. There's probably one in my backyard right now eating all my shrubs. There was one at the office today. Um, four toes. Very hard to actually find a good print with toes in it. <laughs> I've been looking, trying to get a picture. No luck. What you'll see here is, so on the right, you'll get that Y shape. And that was, if you think about that video, those front legs landing one behind each other and then the back legs landing. So that bottom picture, the direction of traffic is going to the right. So the front legs, or sorry, the hind legs lead that movement. So you'll see this Y tracks. But again, if it's deep snow, you'll just see these marks, random marks. And you okay, so what do we have here? Then you have to say, well, could it be a deer? No, it's, you can actually see the shape of the body into that snow. Um, and that can tell you about the height of the animal because a deer wouldn't leave that body in. You actually, because they have long legs, a coyote might not, depending on the depth of the snow, um, where a fat little dog, like a wiener dog, would leave a very, probably just a big wide belly drag. So, you know, again, it's not just the track, it's what is everything else telling you? Where are they? What's happening? How deep's the snow? Things like that. So you get the good prints and then you get the huh prints that you have to you know investigate a little further um squirrel versus rabbit so you can see on the left there's that again that y-shaped rabbit and then the squirrel is a bit more of a, a w um with the, the two outer ones and then the two together they will both do those tracks the other ones <laughs> 
So um, sometimes squirrels will leave what almost looks like a rabbit track, and sometimes a rabbit will hop and kind of sit and leave what looks like a squirrel track. So that single track might not be the only thing you want to look at. You have to look beyond. Um, if it comes off a tree, starts at a tree, ends at a tree and disappears, it's probably not a rabbit. It's probably a squirrel. So again, that, you know, look at more than just the one print. All right, number of toes, we're still at the count four. Uh, and cats and dogs are also in this four count. Um, domestic cats are, are out there in the forest. They're either pets that have wandered or people somehow think that, oh, I'm gonna release my cat into the wild and be wild again and they dump their cat. They're not, <laughs> so please don't do that. They're domestic, they're not part of nature. They cause a lot of destruction and they don't fare well. It's horrible for the cats. So four, four toes is in the cat. Um, I have heard stories about bobcat around here, but a long time ago. You're not gonna see a lynx. If you're a northern moraine, um, a bit further north, you might be lucky enough to find a bobcat track. A cat track will be about the size of a, a toonie, maybe a little bit bigger if you have a big tom or something. Um, a bobcat will be maybe about twice that. So smaller than the, the kind of bottom of a, of a, a pop cat. And if you find one, let me know, because <laughs> I'd love to see one. I'm still looking, I'm so close that, but it wasn't. Um, they tend to be rounder. And so when we go to dog prints, I'll show you the difference. And I'm just trying to look at the chat. If there's anything going on, Nikki, I'm trusting you to unmute and let me know. Um, so these are the kind, again, you're not gonna get that perfect print that they show you in the books. You'll get something like, this in the sand or this in the snow. Something to remember about cats, what do they do with their claws? They retract them. And this is a really neat adaptation. So when they're stalking, so dogs, coyotes, wolves, dingoes, all that, they will chase prey. Cats will stalk and then pounce. So when they're stalking, nails will inhibit their ability to feel the ground they're walking on. They cannot take their eyes off that prey. So they have to be able to feel their way and see what they're walking on with their feet because their eyes are focused on what they're stalking. So their nails retract so they don't interfere with that. But when they need that grip, out they come, either to grab the prey or if something slippery. Canines, because they chase, they want that grip all the time because they're, they're chasing. So their nails don't retract. So that's kind of an evolutionary thing. So um, if there's no nail tracks at all, and it's a bit rounder and it's got four toes, you might have a cat. If you absolutely see claw marks and it's not a slippery substrate, you probably have a dog or a coyote. And we'll talk about the differences there, okay? So here we are into the dog family. And if you notice, the prints tend to be more oblong. So a cat one will be more rounded, wider, and a dog or canine will be more oblong, okay? Here's the fun part. There is a group of dog breeds that they call the cat, what is it, cat-footed dogs that look like cats because they have a like a more cat-like um, paw print. And that's why I thought I had a bobcat. <laughs> And then I learned that one. I'm like, oh, make it even harder. Um, but you're looking at uh, more of a, a longer than it is wider with these guys. So how do you tell a dog from a coyote? And around here, this is probably the most challenging track and the most common tracks you're going to see, which one's which. So our domestic dogs tend to be fed a little bit more than a coyote would. Um, they also spend a lot of their life on hard surface. So they get sprawled out paws. They're also not as fit as a coyote because you know they sleep, they do that. Coyotes are always on the go, survival, survival, food, survival. So they have very tight, muscular paws. For dogs, they get sprawled out, they're not they're a little heavy, adds to it. And so it's uh, a bit different. We also tend to trim our dog nails um, or even if you don't, they're also walking more likely to walk on pavement more often, um, 
sidewalks, your floors. So their nails are dull. We're a coyote because they're even in the urban areas tend to be on soft land and no one's trimming their tails or sorry, their, their nails. They have sharp claws. So if you see a print and you're not sure if it's a dog or a coyote, if it's got like almost a square off fat nail mark, it's probably a dog. If it's a pinprick, it's probably a coyote. And that's again, based on how they spend their lives. So here you see, and if you look at the difference, the nails also tend to point in different directions where with a the coyote, they're all tight and pointing forward. And the front two ones will almost touch like that. And that's when I said they sometimes can look a bit like a deer. Um, on the right, you can see the typical path of a coyote, and again, or a fox. It's straight, it's conserving energy. If they wander to explore something, they, they come back and the minimal, least pathway taken. A dog's like, oh, there's my tail, woo, woo, woo. I gotta pee over there, I gotta stick that, I'm gonna go over there, oh, there's my tail again. They're all, all over the place. Now, some dogs are nice and they go straight, but they do tend to sniff and pee a bit more than a coyote would. So again, the track will tell you one thing, the pattern will tell you a bit more. Um, the X. So over here, if you look at the two prints, this was, a, I love when I get them side by side. This was a, I think it was a fox print next to a dog print um, and a bunch of people prints. Can you guys see this, how tight this X is? Again, that, that tight, tight, tight paw, that fit paw, the not overweight at all paw, um, it'll have a, an X. So cats won't have that, anything else won't have it. Dog, the X on the dog tends to be kind of more of a, an H shape. If you can see that, it, it kind of has this wider part. It's not that tight of an X. So that's a really good way of telling them apart. There are very, very fit dogs. Um, we have a farm dog um, up at the, the horse place and she just runs around all day long. And sometimes I have to take a double look at hers because she's so fit that she has that tight paw. She also is not spending time on asphalt because she's running around the fields happily. So, but again, I can still see that she's chasing her tail and going here and going there, so. And here's another comparison. So uh, on the picture on the left, we'll open up the chat. Which one do you think is dog and which one do you think is coyote in these two tracks? Oh, where can I get my chat there? Yeah. Come on. Okay, so on the left picture over here, there's one track and then there's another. So which one is dog and which one is cat? I mean, sorry, coyote. It's been a really long day, bear with me. Yeah. Yep, you're right. So you can really see the difference. Coyotes, they got, or fox, they got a place to be efficient. All right, good, everyone's listening. <laughs> Let me just close this, there we go. And so I just saw the, the uh, question about what's the difference between other tracks but in brown, it's just a joke. That basically 95% of tracks aren't very good. The humor, I love when I have to explain my jokes. I have to do it way too often, I should really refine them. Um, here's another great example, and this was down at the Aurora Arboretum one morning, I got out there early um, and dog and coyote next to each other. So you can, here you can see not just the pattern, you can see the track difference. So a very oblong, the nails are pointing forward, you get that X, and then on the right side, you get the dog and it's, the, the nails are a bit sprawled out. Um, the X mark is more of an H shape. They're kind of dragging their feet. So side by side, you can see the difference. Now you'll notice that within the two prints, that one is bigger than the other. The front paw is bigger than the back paw. And that's because the front paw supports the chest, the head, more weight. We kind of, because of our hands and our feet, we assume the, the back feet would be bigger. But with these guys and any animal that's on all four, their head and everything is, is heavier. So the front paws um, will be bigger. So that would be cats and dogs, basically, canines and, and felines. With something like squirrels and bunnies, it's the other way around. But you can see, so this this would be the rear, and this would be the front. Okay. Uh, just check questions. 
Okay, we're good. There we go. Um, I, I will admit one of the things that I struggle with is telling an individual fox track from a coyote. So their stride length, which we'll talk about later, is very, very similar. They're only off by a little bit. And I don't always have a measuring tape with me. Normally I do. Um, when you get a good clear print, you get this kind of, um, they call it a, a, a chevron shape in that back heel. Um, and you can see it here. It's also, they have more hair on their, their feet. So if you get a typical wild canine print, but the back part's almost not clear and it's broken up, it's fuzzy, it's because they of the hair and the coyotes don't have as much fur on their paws. So they'll get a cleaner back pad print. Okay, but if, if <laughs> you can get um, a really good clear fox print in this kind of just shallow, just landed, not too wet snow, you might actually get to see that, that little kind of extra chevron at the back. Um, I thought I had a pair of coyotes in a forest for a while, and then I saw the baby foxes and went, oh, I was wrong. <laughs> uh, so they are very difficult to tell apart. Here again, you know, if the prints look like this diagram, pff, you wouldn't need me. Um, <laughs> but they never do. So this kind of shows some of the differences. Uh, you can see that kind of chevron shape. Cats, I said they're, they're, wider than they are longer but they also have if you get a good print this three lobed shape at the bottom of the heel pad where a coyote will be um either kind of like almost like a v shape or at most like a, a two lobe flat thing <laughs> that's a technical term but cats will have that one two three so if you get a really good print you can actually count those three lobes and again no claw marks All right, so now we're getting more toes and we're on the five and four. So um, the rodents will have five hind toes and four front toes. Of course, I'm looking at that. That's actually, I think, backwards. Anyways, because I'm like, oh, I can see five. Um, however, saying that, they, have, they do have five, four, and do claw. Anyways, um, good luck seeing an actual print of a mouse. <laughs> They're so small, even in that great snow, you see patterns, you will not see tracks. Um, but those patterns, and these are very challenging, we'll tell you a bit. So a mouse tends to jump, they do that bound, but they'll also walk, but they have those long tails. So you'll see a tail mark. A shrew has a tail, and this is something I just learned this week, Again, you learn something every time you go out. Um, but they spend a lot of their time, and, and same with moles, underground. Voles, metal voles, will run. They only have a short tail, so most of the time you won't see a tail drag. But if it's deep snow, that will sometimes register a tail drag. So these are not easy. Um, the one I got had big feet, so I thought originally weasel, long tail weasel, but there was a tail drag and it was a thick fat one. And I thought, is this a rat? But the width was too narrow for a rat, uh, like one of the Norway mats, They're, they would be a bit wider. I was completely stumped, I posted it, nobody <laughs> responded. Finally, someone said, wow, you've got a star nose mole and they spend most of their time underground. And for whatever reason, he was out that day and he said, there's certain periods where they'll come out and he was all over the place. And I couldn't find a hole of him going back into because sometimes they'll come up for a little bit and go under. So I had no idea what it was. And, and he was all excited. He's like, this is rare to find prints like this because they were all over the place. So he still gets stumped. Um, and that was, but you could, I could narrow it down to rodent with a tail. Now, and if you know what a star nose mole is, and I apologize, I meant to put this into the presentation. They have those big, big front claws to dig and tunnel. So those are making the big prints. And in the winter, especially, they carry a lot of their storage of their fat into their tail as like a storage unit, I guess. So that's what left that really defined tail, which I assumed, you know, Sterno's mole doesn't have a big tail. I assumed that big, ugly, nasty, faraway mat rat running around. Um, so sometimes you need help. 
<laughs> and you'll get stumped. Rodents, you can tell it's a rodent. That's the easiest thing to do. You can't always tell which one it is, okay? So that's my very short one. Here's some examples. So here's a mouse that kind of sat. So you have that long tail impression because he sat up. And on the right is the more typical pattern where they're bounding and you get that skinny little tail drag through there. I'm just paying attention. I just want to check the chat if I can get that, make sure there's no like. Oh, start with sterno is more. Yeah, start. All right, thanks everybody. You're handling your own questions. Awesome. Um, this is typical of rodents that spend their time under, you'll see these rodent tracks. So they tunnel under the snow in the winter. And then when it melts, you'll see their little rodent highways. And it's kind of cool because if you can see on oops, this one, you can almost make out the footprints the way it's melted out. So you can see these teeny little dots. Again, I could not see any toes. I could tell they were footprints. That was it. And that's the best um, example I've seen of, of actual tracks as opposed to the tunnels um in the middle again you can see that bound with a tail and they usually end up going into a hole where you see if, they, if there's a road or a pathway they can't tunnel underneath because the snow is compacted or it's asphalt so they have to come up and run over top and then back down and that's why owls and hawks tend to hang out by trails and, and roads so they don't have to dive into the snow um, and that's where you'll get a good track, but generally they, they tend to tunnel under the snow in the winter. And then good luck figuring out what it is. <laughs> it's a tunnel of something. All right, so we're at squirrels again. Um, and we looked at the squirrels. They have the big back feet, the middle ones, and they tend to have that, that W shape. Chipmunks, I honestly don't see a lot of chipmunk tracks because they're hibernating. Um, but they'll be very similar on a smaller scale. So there's some examples of squirrels. So they're going um, left to right. So their front feet have landed in front of, or sorry, their hind feet have landed in front of their front feet. Again, you don't see that textbook shape or, or design of a squirrel, but the pattern will tell you. And on the right, that is a good snow print for a squirrel. You can actually almost, almost make out the toes to count. <laughs> but again, the pattern speaks volumes. My favorite family, the mustelids. So this is, um, I just think they're amazing. They're, people kind of think that bears and coyotes and wolves are like predators. They're not, they're about 50% vegetarian. These guys, oh, they are the badass ones. These guys are ferocious. They do not know their size. They will take on prey way bigger than them. Um, they are probably the closest, they are true carnivores basically. Um, Occasionally they'll eat something else, but of all of our mammals, these guys are the meat eaters as much as they can get. Otters, oh my gosh, they're so cute, but they will go up into a beaver or a, a muskrat lodge and eat them all and then hang out there till they're hungry again. <laughs> um, I shouldn't laugh, it's sad, but they're just like, I gotta eat. They tend to not make their own burrows unless they're nesting. So a short-tailed weasel will, um, find a chipmunk who's hibernating they fit into their holes they'll basically go in while the guy's half asleep eat them and hang out there in a bit till he needs to eat again so they don't have to waste energy building their own home because they just eat their guests when they, and then hang out at their house afterwards um people get really upset about mink and that you know go oh they went into my chickens and they ate everything they're just killers for no good reason oh i hate them i hate them things they're not going to waste energy doing killing for fun. Um, that's something weird that humans have adopted in some cases. They went, oh my gosh, I have a place to stay. I've got all this food. I'm going to kill it and I'm going to eat my face off for the next three months. And then the farmer comes in. He goes, oh, oh, better leave. And there goes his plan of just eating and sitting around for the next couple months. So they kill everything to cash it. They're also reflex killers. So, you know, hey, if it's there, they'll kill. But that's the point. They're not killing it to waste it. They're killing it because they're like, I'm going to kill while I have the chance because I need to eat. And if I don't, I could die. And oh my gosh, what is all this prey doing in a confined area? Sweet. Kill, kill, kill. I'm going to eat for months. Yeah. That's kind of their animal instinct with a little less humor or animation to it. Uh, they're not killing for fun. They're killing because they're like, great. I've got a cache of food forever until it rots. 
Um, so a lot of people don't like them because of that, but they are phenomenal predators. They have five toes. They tend to often be in a, a very shallow J shape. So you can kind of see going left to right with the weasel, the right side is a bit lower. So they have this kind of arch lopsided upside down J shape to their prints. So here we go, river otters. We do have them around. Um, 20 years ago when I started, we were looking at reintroducing them because they weren't down here, but then found out they were already here. Um, they've been seen in stormwater ponds, Fairy Lake. Um, I found this one in a forest at a beaver dam. Um, twice, two different beaver dams I saw them this summer. They will slide through snow, and that's a really good indicator of them. Um, as you see these, these kind of wide slip sliding, down they go. Um, that's their way, so they'll bound and then go wee on their belly, and then bound and then wee on their belly when they can through snow and that's it sounds like fun and you add the wee to it and of course it's fun but it's actually an energy conservation tool why bound when you can slide um so that's kind of their typical way of movement something you won't see in the summer months but in the winter it's wow and i've found them in places i was shocked at like a little teeny stream and then bound in slide marks from a river otter that makes it easy when you see those slide marks you're up oh, easy don't even have to count toes we got a river otter or a weird dog. <laughs> um, based on this picture, this mink will also slide. Um, that was more of a scent marking, but they have a smaller paw. And again, they have this kind of hook J shape to the, their prints. Um, I found these ones, this was last week, perfect snow conditions. And I think the best mink tracks I ever found. They tend to be around streams and water. This one was up high on a ridge in the middle of a forest. There was a stream kind of down at the bottom, but he'd come up went all over the ridge and hunting, right where the sternose mole was. It's so, so exciting right there at that time. Um, so at the bottom, you can see that bound, and it looks like they're bounding with two feet, but they've actually bounded and, and placed the feet so it's a double register. So four feet have landed in two tracks. But again, they can roll through the snow and, and make di different tracks. They're not, they're consistent to some effect, but these guys change their pattern up. This was my super exciting find on Monday night, about 15 minutes from my house in Newmarket, fisher tracks through the forest. Um, I was out at night and there was dog tracks everywhere. And lo and behold, I just happened to glance and went, oh, fishers, how did I know? See these two by two tracks? That's Fisher. It's actually four by four, but it looks like two by two. So they do a bound, but they do it at kind of an angle. And what that does, it kind of keeps their, their nose free on this side. And coyotes and, and foxes will do it too. It'll do like a side movement. It's to keep their nose free to pick up the scent so that they don't interfere with it. I don't know what the difference would be in front of you or side, but apparently that's what it is. So these guys do a side, a two step. So you see these offset two, and that's their bound marks. Um, and on the left, this, all the pictures have been my own, but I still have yet to see a fisher. <laughs> but uh, so there's a borrowed one here with uh, permission and credits, and you'll see their, their feet. Um, they are in the same family as river otters and skunks and weasels and wolverines. These guys are closer to wolverines. And then here is, again, your typical, this is up in Pephali tract one. And um, you can almost count the toes in this print. See, one, two, three, four. Oh, there's the fifth one down there. So even if you think, oh, there's only four toes, you have that offset J pattern, and that will tell you it's mustelid. And then size and location will tell you where you're at. Um, so if it's small, little teeny ones, you're in the weasel family and they're a bit harder to tell between least um and especially between short tail and long tail um locations best guess for that one um but if it's river otter one sometimes can look like fishers but if they start sliding you don't have a fisher if they end and go up a tree you've got a fisher because they climb trees pine martins are also in this family but you won't see them down here. Um, there's been no record of them for a long, long time. But if you're in Algonquin Park, they are everywhere. They will sometimes have this two by two pattern. Sometimes they'll have all four patterns. Sometimes they'll have a walk. Um, but 
again, you're looking at the, that J shape of the toes, even if you can't see the toes, you just see that shape and, and that when they go to their standard gait. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so we're the second group of five toes. And these are our ones that are going to do that. Um, I call it the waddle, but it's the, um, I can't remember the, the track again. I always call it waddle, but that side-by-side -side walk. Um, and that's your raccoons. Most of the ones that aren't dog are raccoon. When you're at tracking, they, that group covers about 75, 80% of all tracks you'll find. They're high five. So raccoon always look like they're a little high five in the snow. Um, you have these long skinny fingers and the thumb tends to be off the side, not totally off to the side, like a, a possum, which we'll look at, but it's like a high five, little teeny high five. And then again, big foot next to the high five in sets of two. So not that kind of bounding one we looked at the fisher, but two different sizes next to each other, even. So here's an example of that. So you can see that kind of high five. Again, this is tracking. You're not gonna get a perfect track. I've been trying for years. But the little hand is next to the big back foot. Okay, and two by two by two. So can you guys see the difference between that one and the two by two by the fisher, which is a bound? Okay, it's just slightly off. It's, it's close. And the more you do this, the more, the more you'll pick up on those subtleties, but hopefully it makes sense. And um, somebody asked about the opossum. These are the coolest tracks to find, well, besides a fisher or a river otter, but the shape of them looks like those old Ikea things you used to get on, put on your walls. They're like a high five, but they're a splat, a splattered high five. They have these thumbs that are almost opposable. So the front foot is on the left here and it's like a splatter high five. But the back foot, as you can see it here, the thumb almost totally bends backwards. So you'll get, it looks like um, the toes are pointing forward and then you have it like a disjointed thumb coming out here. So you can kind of see that in the bottom one. So you've got your toes forward and then this weird, awkward thumb going the other direction. But then this cool splatter high five, which is almost like a star. And that's a possum. Again, if you look at the high five here is more like a high five with your thumb in. And then the opossum is that splatter high five. Very cool tracks. Nothing looks like it really. Once you see them, you'll be like, oh, that's what she was talking about. The splatter high five from Ikea. Uh, hopefully I'm not dating myself there. <laughs> hopefully people know what I'm talking about with those splatter things you used to buy and put on your wall and stuff. Um, striped skunk. They are very distinct, but because they're not very active in the winter, they still will come out in a warm night. Um, you don't see the tracks as often. And I was fortunate to find these ones on the side of a wet road and it's the best skunk tracks I've seen and probably only a handful of tracks I've seen of a skunk because again, it's winter. They have, again, it's, it's five, looks like a raccoon, very similar. And I had people say, nope, this is a raccoon. And I said, nope, it's skunk. But they look like they have long nails where the raccoon looks like they have long fingers. So it's almost like, um, a teen, like a, a fist pump high five, but with really, really long things sticking out of it, like almost like the actor Wolverine thing. Um, so you can see that they also tend to have, and you can see this in the back foot a bit more, they have a broken pad. So you'll see the, the toes or the fingers, a pad, a, a separation, and then a bottom pad. So it's like three sections, but the weird long nails, the front pad, a break and then that back pad, and that's a skunk. Again, not common to see, um, but you might see them in a garden if it's, if it's, you know, you have wet mud or something like that, but in the winter, you're not gonna get a really good shot of them. And that separation in those toes might not show as well in the snow. And our beaver, um, they are, everywhere in near water. So they're very common. This one was taken down at Fairy Lake. Everyone knows them. Um, they do have that wet back feet, but that doesn't always register. So again, we're at five toes and bears in here too. So I found these tracks one day and I saw this drag thing being dragged. They were so close. There was five. The size was right. I brought up my measuring stick, everything. And I thought, I found the fisher tracks, cool. 
and it's dragging. So fishers eat porcupine. I thought, oh, it's dragging a porcupine. This is like the coolest track ever. And then I noticed there was no blood. And I couldn't figure out why. So I kept hoping I'd look up and see a fisher eating a porcupine in a tree or something. So I followed the trail and I thought, no, something's not right here. There, there's no way. It was a beaver and it was the weird, it, again, it was in that same area of the river, river otter track, skinny, skinny, little teeny stream, typical of the marine. And it was dragging a tree of some sort or a branch, um, not a porcupine. <laughs> so the fact that there was no blood, I went, oh, then I had to go back, reassess, remeasure. And I was not even considering beaver because of where it is. No, nope, it was a beaver. And I saw the one track, it dragged one thing, never found a chew mark, never saw another track again. Just this random once, once beaver. Um, so that one stumped me, but again, I had to think through, I had to think of the situation, not just the track, because I thought it was a fisher. Um, and again, because I spent a lot of time in the snow, you're not likely to see a lot of prints. Where you'll see them is if there's a, an island or an ice and they're climbing up out of the water, you can get good prints, but you should be too out in the water on that kind of situation because it's a bit dangerous. Um, but five toes, they, they tend to do a bit of a, a diagonal walk, but they'll pace sometimes if they're slow moving. Not, not an easy thing to track. Um, and not an easy print because they're hard to find and they're not always clear. But if you get a good one and it's web feet and it doesn't have a J shape like a river otter because they have web feet too, um, you might have a beaver. You guys are like, oh, that's crystal clear, Aileen. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> not an easy thing tracking sometimes. Uh, bear tracks. Again, you're not going to see them in the snow, but occasionally a bear will show up in York region and along the moraine and to the east and the west. Um, this one was up just at the, on the Bruce Peninsula, and I thought it was this beautiful, lo lovely fen and this lovely walkway through the fen to protect it. And I thought, oh, someone let their dog run through the fen and they jumped up and there's mud everywhere. And people are, you know, ruining this beautiful orchids and all that. And then I went, wait a second, that's a big dog. And then I looked a little closer and realized that I had bear tracks. <laughs> I was so excited because I went running looking for it. Um, but it had gotten out of the fen because it was muddy and then followed the nice casual um, walk across that uh, boardwalk out to the parking lot. It was easier. So they tend to have um, the back foot's a bit longer. It's the front track is going to look wider, so kind of like a, a cat track. So it's wider than it is longer, but you're going to have all five toes and it's it's very wide. It almost looks like if you were or not me because I have small feet, but if a man were to walk on his tippy toes, you'd see that kind of that face print and then the five toes. Um, if you see a bear track, there's really very little you can confuse it with. It's five feet and it, it honestly looked like someone's tippy toeing. So maybe you could confuse it with a tippy toe person. Um, and they do a diagonal walk. Lumber. They also tend to turn their, their paws in a little bit. So they tend to have like a, a, a pigeon toe kind of walk to them sometimes. But you don't see them often. Um, I, you have to find a track down here and I know areas where they're, they're common. Um, the oddball tracks. <laughs> These do exist. They are called polydactyl cats and they have multiple toes. So talk about a tracking challenge. If you were to come across this, <laughs> Like, what? <laughs> Bailey didn't talk about six or more toes, but these do exist. They're rare, but they are out there. Um, also the double register, which I mentioned that if someone with something with four toes oversteps and they're over, you may look like you have six toes or eight or something. Um, six is more often, sometimes even five, because it's just, they're so perfect placement that there's just one little pause off. Um, so sometimes you can get multiple toes and that is going to be a lot of detective work to figure that one out. Okay, so uh, how are we doing for time? Okay, good. Um, this is kind of a, a, a summary of the amount of toes you're looking at. Um, groundhogs, you don't see a lot of tracks again in the summer. Um, they're out, but they're in grassy areas. And then in the winter, they're cozy and sleeping in their bed. So some of these things you're not likely to see. Winter is the best time for tracking where we are, and you're going to look at, you're going to get deer, 
rabbits, the cats, dogs, canines, raccoon, mustelids, maybe a beaver muskrat. I didn't even get onto muskrat. Might get a possum, possibly a porcupine. Um, they're pacers as well, and they very, very toed in. I left that one out for time. Um, and then your, your rodents, okay? So that's kind of a, a quick summary of everything I talked about. Count your toes, look at your pattern, etc. So now we're gonna look at size and scale. And this is one thing that makes it so hard because someone will post a single print in snow and say, Amy, what's this? Um, is there some scale to that? <laughs> so if you look at the left track, and we're gonna, I'm gonna check out the chat. What do you think I have based on what I've taught you? Is it a coyote? So all the nails are pointing forward. It's a tight print. You can see the X. Is it a coyote? What do you think? Where's the chat? Don't have a chat anymore. Is anyone out there? <laughs> People are answering. Oh, okay. I've, I've lost my chat then. Okay, okay. yeah, we're getting lost. Let's okay, see. The answer? I think the consensus is yes. It's a coyote. Okay. All right. So it meets all the criteria. It's without scale. You're not going to know it's my little crazy dog, Minnie. She's no longer with us. She, if you look at the muscle, she was nuts. She could jump over six foot fences. She ran. The vet actually had a hard time giving injections because she was so muscular from jumping. You can see it kind of here. Um, she was not overweight because she had a knee problem and I was I kept her thin for that reason to protect her. Um, but without scale, that looks like a coyote print because she had those tight things. She was a nightmare to trim her nails, so they were pretty sharp too. Um, but scale is everything. Some, not everything. It's a big chunk of it. So whenever you're taking a picture, scale. If you want to look at it or ask somebody, put scale. Um, you'll notice in some of my pictures, I have my bird's lip balm. I always have that on me because I get dry lips when I'm out in the winter. And that is like my standard one because I forget an actual measuring tool. Um, I do have like a, a loose one that I carry in my backpack that I will pull out when I actually need to, if it's not obvious, I need to do some specific measurements of stride, which we'll look at. Um, but if, if you want help, show something put your foot in there and say you know it's a size six woman or it's a size 15 men um something for scale that makes a big difference for IDing. um measuring so this one was one that was posted on the york region nature group um any thoughts on what this could be and nick you're gonna have to read them out for me because i don't know why i can't see the chat yeah <laughs> fox we've got from the wartel family All right. Cat, cat. Oh, now I can see it again. Tricky. <laughs> <That's our demo. laughs> All right. Um, so this was a cat slide. So you can't see, but there actually was, there is a claw register because it slipped and then uh, put its claws out to try and stop the slip. And this one looks like it has one, two, three, four, five, six toes. Um, it wasn't a polydactyl cat. It was a, um, a double register. So the front stepped in the back. And again, that's something they'll do on slippery or deep snow, again, to conserve energy and protect and, and quiet. So this was a cat track. It was originally submitted straight up like this. And I said, can you go back out and put a ruler next to it? and take a closer picture of it. And she did, and I said, can I borrow this from my presentation? This is awesome. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's not that obvious and there can be tricks. So scale is important. And how do you measure scale? So when you're measuring, there's two things you wanna measure. So the stride and the straddle. The stride on a diagonal walker or anything is going to be the from the front toe to the front of the toe of the back foot. So the front toe of the front foot and the front toe of the back foot. That distance from toe to toe is your stride length. And then you can look at it up, you know, if you have a good guide 
and it'll say, you know, oh, if it's, you know, 12 inches stride, it could be fox. If it's 16 inches stride, it could be coyote. And then you want to look at the straddle, which is the distance from um, the outside of both paws. So I mentioned the sternose mole. When I looked at that, it was not wide enough for Norway rat, rat which is what confused me. Um, so that will tell you much. So that's how you can measure one. And if you can get one of those little kind of pocket um, measuring tapes, the metal ones, that's great. They're just throw them in your backpack. Uh, not they don't weigh a lot. I made the mistake of getting like a kind of you know the ones you use for measuring your your waistline as it grows in COVID or whatever. Um, a thin little one, thinking it was great, but when I lay it down and try and take a picture, it it's wiggles. So if you can get a firm one, a metal one, like the one in the picture, even one of the little ones, it it's a great way to get your measurements out when you're tracking. Okay, um, so you're looking at your toes, your measurement, your location, your scale, other things that can make it even harder. <laughs> Melting. Um, you see this quite a bit is, oh my gosh, this track was huge. And it looks very similar to the one on the right. And you can see by just that dark gray and the ice that the geothermal heat from the ground underneath. So this is common in um, the beginning of the winter, typically, or if it's a very warm day, when it melts, it, it's, it's called melting out. And so it melts out wider. And so a standard, uh, I don't know, hound dog track can end up looking like a, a mastiff track because it melts out. So if you see a track and it looks giant and it's got this kind of gray ice on it, it's likely that it's melted out and your size then will be distorted. So the other factors you're going to look at are, again, the number of your toes. This stride length won't vary as much as the track length. Your straddle length is not going to be affected as much. So look beyond the track, look at the picture, the whole picture. Um, mud drying has the opposite effect. It'll actually shrink in the sun. So you'll get a track that gets smaller. Um, slips. Like the one on the left, this looks like it's got a huge hind paw. This was a slip. That was the cat track that slipped. Um, babies are immature, so if it's springtime, I um, mean, even into early fall, you might get. I once found a deer track that was about as big as a quarter, and <laughs> it was a brand new baby doe. It was the cutest little track. Um, so sometimes that can mess up your your length and your measurements. And then, as I pointed out with my Netso dog. Uh, fit dogs can also look very much like a coyote. Okay, if they're right next to someone walking and they look like they're the same thing, um, same age, I guess, you probably have a fit dog. So while you're measuring, and this is why field guides are, are good, um, this is kind of the breakdown of the strides and what you have. What's hard to find with coyotes is that a lot of them are the Western coyote measurements that you find in guidebooks, and we have Eastern coyotes, and they're a bit bigger. Um, so it's hard. You have to, if you see a coyote measurement, see if it's actually um, Eastern coyote. And if it is, it'll specifically say Eastern coyote. If it just says coyote, take it, don't take it too seriously. It's probably a Western and much smaller um, sizes. So, uh, Nikki, I think we can probably share this somehow later, because, or you guys can take a screenshot. Um, you, you can, this kind of gives you your measurements and your, what to start with if you're actually measuring. Sometimes you need to do it, like with the beaver thing that I thought was a fisher. Um, and they will vary again, you know, what they're eating, um, babies, things like that. Okay, so how do you do, you got to get out and practice. Um, you can read every book, and I'm, I'm holding up this book. It's called, this is a really good one, Tracking and the Art of Seeing, because it's not just, this is a track. It talks about all the signs of wildlife that will help you read the situation and read the nature and the ecology. Um, it talks about, you know, scratch marks and denning and um, movement and all that. So this is a really good one. It's by Paul Rosen. Uh, Resendas, and it's yeah, tracking and the art of seeing how to read animal tracks and signs. So that's a really good one. Um, but if you look at the picture on the left, we're going to do a few practice ones for you. Um, 
all this, all these tracks looked like a dog running around. But it was in a, a bit of an island um, that there was no tracks, lead, like no dog tracks could get to it. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. I thought there was a fight or something. And you can't really see it, but in the middle, there was a teeny little bit of bloodied urine. And this was in January and it smelled like skunk, not full skunk, just skunk light. And I couldn't figure out what's going on. This was two, because I know I have kids in the group. This was two foxes that were um, actively getting married so they could have baby foxes. <laughs> if that makes sense to the adults. Um, it, it was mating. And so this is atypical because you would never see them, so many prints in one area, so haphazard like this without a kill or something. Um, this was, there was ones you could see where they were crouching in a submission state, which was flirting, if you will. Um, there was the circular part was if anyone's familiar with that that process that dogs and canines go through to make babies um, that was what was going on that was awesome I was so excited and then I got to see the baby box <laughs> oh my gosh well, they were cute so I saw it from marriage to family it was wonderful um, over here you can see there's it's this is the hard part is showing pictures of snow there is four tracks and they went up and over the fence in one single bound. That was a coyote. Just popped over that fence. Um, which wow, that's pretty impressive. And no like, you know, footing around. It was just walk, walk, bound, boop, over, walk, walk, and off they went. So you really learn about the animals. Wild animals are hard to see in the wild. They spook off, they don't behave normally. But when you learn to read the tracks, you learn the story. The snow tells a story. Um, and you can learn what they're doing, how they behave. I've learned so much from tracking, more than seeing animals, because they behave differently in your presence, because they're like, ah, human. So it's, it's fun to get out there. It's like detective work. Okay, so guess the tracks. We're going to open up the chat and take a look at that. What is this track? All right, you guys are learning. Honeymoon, yep. <laughs> All right, you got the Virginia Possum, the little uh, high five. All right. How about this one? Yeah. All right, yep, you got cats. So one, two, three, four, no nail marks. Why are there so many toes? It's a double register. So you're getting the track from the front and the back paws together. Okay. These are good. What about this one? Again, there's my famous lip balm. <laughs> Job. High five. All right. Oh, smarty with the procyon. Procyon. I would say that wrong. Right, you've got the high five, but with the, not the crazy Ikea thumb. That's your raccoon. You can also see they have this kind of hollow bit in the middle of their paw. Um, it's not always there, but. All right, you guys are good. Uh, what about this one? It's a bit hard to see, but this is tracking. What do you guys think of this one? <laughs> yeah, you got the, yeah. All right, so this is a double register mink track. Um, so a dog and coyote would also have that as a double register, but you'd see claw marks, especially in this, this the snow. Um, you're right. Good job, Robinson. You need measurement. There's no scale to this. Thank you. That's a blade of grass. It's very small. Um, so sometimes if you don't have scale, there's something nearby. Um, trail cameras, people, what is this? I can't see what it is. And you can't get this idea for scale. Go out, stand where it was, and compare pictures. That's a little cheat for trail cameras. Um, it is a mink track, and it's a double placement. So you guys are good. This is tough. It, you picked up on the J shape. Um, you picked up on the need a measurement, 
just keep in mind about the nails. You can't see the nails. And again, this track alone, I would have been, no, I'm not really entirely sure, but when you stand back and if you saw the rest of the tracks, you'd see it was a bound um, movement and it was along a stream going in and out of the water, onto the ice, into the water, onto the ice. Um, raccoons won't do that. All right, what about this one? Looks like a cartoon. <laughs> All right, we got dog, fox. All right, so we got nail marks on this one. Kind of looks like five toes. This is actually a cat with its claw, a dog skidding, right? It's a cat skidding. And so with those pin, thin, 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 again, scale, you're right. Um, those teeny little nails came out for traction. So this is a cat track with claws. So there, it's not a hard, fast rule that they won't have claw register. Sometimes they will, but they won't, it's, it's atypical. They have to be slipping or sliding or an unstable ground, okay? Cat tripping, yep. And it's a double register too, so there's extra toes. So I know it, it isn't easy. <laughs> Um, again, if you were to see the bigger picture and the follow-up tracks and things leading into it and the size, it'd be a lot more clear. All right, this one's fun. What do we have going on here? Oops, sorry. Deer. Okay, but what's going on here? What's all this stuff? Bird. I didn't even go to birds. Or flamingos. So this deer stopped and sniffed at the snow to see if there was something underneath. Those are nose marks from the deer. Yeah, we're licking snow. So that was the face going into it. So that was kind of cool because you deer track, deer track. And then I'm like, what happened here? I'm like, oh, cute. It's nose marks. Um, so again, you learn a bit more that they're stopping and, you know, as you said, licking or sniffing at the snow as they go. And then they kept walking, sniffed, and then started digging it up and finding stuff. So this is why I used to hate winter. I love winter now because I go tracking. Um, and I learned so much about wildlife. It's so much fun. Just properly. And, yeah. All right. And the next one. Almost forgot what this was. I'm like, what am I pointing out here? Coyote and a rabbit. Yeah. That's a good guess. I'm actually like, what is this again? Now I'm having to look sideways at it. Now I remember where I got this. So for scale, because there isn't any, you can see here there's some pine needles. Um, and those are white pine, so they're about um, an inch and a half, two inches. So um, this was a fox that was kind of doing a weird gait. Um, so when I talk about foxes and those fuzzy feet, um, you can see here how the tracks kind of, they don't have that firm hind print. So that was the, the fur of that furry fox foot. I say that three times fast. Um, and he was kind of doing a weird hopping movement. I'm not sure why, um, but it wasn't the typical diagonal gait. Um, oh, it was, I know what it was, it was up a hill. And so it was kind of bounding up the hill, but I turned it sideways to mess with you guys. Now it's all coming back to me. <laughs> I did this presentation a while back and, and uh, I add stuff in and then forget I'm doing it. So it was actually going up a hill. So I tricked you a bit there. At least it's easy to type, but try saying it. <laughs> All right, what about this one? Oh, 
Any guesses on this one? I'm throwing these in to trick you because this is not always easy. <laughs> Ah, Miss Sharp got it. Is it Miss Sharp? It's C Sharp. They got it. Yeah, Derek got it. Right. Snow blobs. Um, and I've seen them because if they're on a drip line of a tree, they'll actually look like a solid track because they, they almost look like they're going in a straight line. When it gets warm, chunks of snow will fall off or if it's windy um, or even ice sometimes like icicles that from melting and it's this it plops and it almost looks like tracks. So again, looking at just them, you have to kind of stand back and say, okay, if they just end where the trees end, it's probably not something. Um, so you have to look beyond that individual track at the bigger picture. And snow blobs can really, really mess with you. <laughs> they, they fall in remarkable patterns. Okay, so I'm encouraging you guys to go out and track. Um, it's it's a lot of fun. We have this event this weekend where you can go track. You post it on INAT. We're doing this cool augmented reality thing um, that you'll have to sign up to find out about and to get out in tracks. And even if all you find is dog and squirrel tracks, you'll start to know you're only finding dog and squirrel tracks. And then you'll start to see when there's that one different one. Um, where I was walking is a popular trail and there was dog tracks everywhere. And I just, and it was at night and I just happened to glance over and immediately picked up those, those Fisher tracks because they stood out. Um, so get out there, make sure you know where you're going. Um, you, you tend to, I've actually tracked, um, tracked myself lost. <laughs> I was following a track and wasn't paying attention and looked up and went, oh, where am I? <laughs> uh oh, and had to track myself back to where I knew where I was. Um, but make sure you know where you're going. Uh, try and stay on the trails as best you can. A good hint is that if you're walking on trails, dogs will kind of go back and forth all over the trail, but wild animals will come from the forest straight across, straight across the track and keep going parallel. So when you see that pattern, then you say, okay, I don't want to look at my 500 dog print. That's different. That's not running around. That's going perpendicular to the trail. I got to take a closer look at that and see what's there. Okay. Um, watch out for things like poison ivy. If you're out in the summer, hypothermia, dress properly. Layers is great. Wear stuff at the base that'll wick away. Um, dehydration, it can happen. Um, do you have to worry about wild animals? Not really. If you're, yeah, try, I don't, even bears are really not don't like people. They, they have great sense of smell and hearing and they will skedaddle. Um, coyotes. I, I track coyotes, fresh prints trying to find them. And I have caught up with them a few times for a split second and they're gone. I'm five foot two. I'm out by myself. I'm, I've had a lot of encounters with coyote and never once have, they even, have I even thought about it. They're gone the second. Um, if you're with your dog, they might spend a bit more time, especially now, because it's love time for them, um, and then baby time, because they don't understand why this dog is in their territory. So they might take a second look at you. Um, about nine, I think the stats, 95 or more coyote interactions with dogs are dogs off leash. So especially this time of year, and when pups come out, keep your dog on a leash if you're out looking for them. Um, it's very stressful for the animals to have dogs running around. They, they don't see them as a pet dog. They see them as a predator and it's, oh, why is there so many predators running around? Um, but generally wild animals, unless you're wearing a meat outfit lying still for multiple times, you don't really have too much to worry about. Other people's dogs off leash, I've had more interactions and bites and jumps and stuff from. Um, but you know, get out there. You'd be amazed what you can find locally in town. I mean, some of the best mink in, in beaver and stuff like that have been right downtown Newmarket. Um, the urban wildlife are, are kind of chill because they're, uh, oops, I'm over time. Anyways, because there's so many people, they can't run away. So you get better interactions, but get out, practice, stay safe, dress for the weather. Um, I don't know why Susan names on this. Oh, she's on there too. Yeah. So uh, there's my contact information. If you send me a picture because you're not sure, or if you're out doing it this weekend at our track and field, Measure, show me scale, show me pattern, okay?
and I'll be uh, able to help. Okay, quick, any questions? Even though we're over time, I'm sorry, I could talk about this forever. Nikki, how are we doing for chats? We're getting lots of thank yous. Um, I don't think there were too many questions, more comments, um, but definitely send us an email if you had a question that we missed. Uh, we just we keep, we keep getting lots of comments in the chat, so sorry if we missed you. Um, and then our question box, what is the difference between others and others, but in brown? I remember that was at the very beginning of your presentation. Yeah, I did mention that it was just my bad humor that basically all tracks are not clear. You get 5% and then the rest are not good. <laughs> but right. they're brown for a change, but <laughs> yeah. And I think also we have got a question, do we get more information? Oh, oops, sorry, they're just moving so fast. Any chance we can get a couple of the pages you showed? Um, and then I'm also just going to say that anyone who signed up for the event or is going to be signing up for the event, um, we're just putting how-to sheets together. We don't want to send you several emails, so we're going to try to send just one email with everything, um, how to use the apps and um, how, how we're looking um, for it to go along with the instructions and everything. So that should be on Friday. Uh, it might be closer to the evening, it might be closer to the morning, but you'll definitely be getting them. All right, in the book, um, yeah, it's The Tracking, The Art of Seeing by Paul Resendez, R-E-Z-E-N-D-E-S, that's the picture. So, uh, Tracking and the Art of Seeing. I can't see the video, so hopefully I'm holding it in the right spot. <laughs> okay, I think that's everyone everything can anyone participate on the weekend event absolutely anyone can participate the only thing we ask is that you respect nature so don't go uh and also the government health restrictions as well so don't be interacting with other people if you're going to do it in a group only do it with your household um and like i said we have the registration up it's uh on eventbrite it's very similar to the one that you registered for this webinar and i'll be sending more information um in terms of instruction and stuff like that and again if you need help with uh registering just send us an email and uh, you should all have my email i've been sending you emails about the registration link um or the webinar link i should say and it is using the iNaturalist app yeah and we'll have uh, information and uh, we have a guide and uh it's cool you pop up and you can see the animal pictures i showed you of how they move it's we gonna be pretty prizes, cool. though, Nikki. We have to come up with some fun prizes for that. I know we really should. That will be a big surprise for everyone. Maybe one of these books. Maybe one of those books. It would be a good one, I think. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, cool. thank you, everyone. Aileen, did you have any last words? No. Just get out, learn, learn, learn. You'll make mistakes. You'll make wonders. You'll be fascinated. You'll be stumped. But you got to do it. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Bye, everyone. Bye. Stay safe out there. Oh, the name of the tracking book. I'll type the answer. Um, oops, I spelled art wrong. Sorry. Slow diaper. Uh, Paul Resendez. There you go. Malmac. There you go. All right. Thanks, Nikki. Good job. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone.